Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. This file is being recorded for the February 2024 edition of Socialism for All, and it's an audiobook of Greetings to the Hungarian Workers by Lenin from 1919. If you like this video, please click like and subscribe, and consider supporting on Patreon or Buy Me a Coffee at patreon.com slash socialismforall or buymeacoffee.com slash socialismforall. There are links to Patreon and Buy Me a Coffee in the video description. So this piece was written May 27, 1919, first published in Pravda number 115, May 29, 19, and published according to the manuscript. The source is Lenin's Collected Works, 4th English Edition, Progress Publishers, Moscow, 1972, Volume 29. It was translated by George Hanna, HTML transcription and markup by David Walters and Robert Sambala, and it's online in the Lenin Internet Archive within the Marxists Internet Archive, marxists.org, thanks as usual to MIA for hosting this and thousands of other free Marxist texts. A quick note here for historical context, May 1919 was about a year and a half after the Socialist Revolution in Russia. Of course, this was accomplished against the backdrop of the chaos of World War I, and Russia was not the only country that had a revolutionary moment at this time. Italy, for example, had an opportunity to have a revolution, but the Socialist Party there was incapable of actually leading it. Germany, too, had a near miss, and Hungary had an actual Soviet-type revolution. However, it was short-lived, with the counter-revolutionary forces fighting back and actually being victorious in the subsequent years. Hungary would become socialist again after World War II and stay that way for a while. For more about the class struggle in Hungary, see the Finnish Bolsheviks channel. He has an entire series on the topic. All right, let's begin. Comrades, the news we have been receiving from the Hungarian Soviet leaders fills us with enthusiasm and pleasure. Soviet government has been in existence in Hungary for only a little over two months. Yet, as regards organization, the Hungarian proletariat already seems to have excelled us. That is understandable, for in Hungary, the general cultural level of the population is higher. Furthermore, the proportion of industrial workers to the total population is immeasurably greater. In Budapest, there are 3 million of the 8 million population of present-day Hungary. And lastly, in Hungary, the transition to the Soviet system, to the dictatorship of the proletariat, has been incomparably easier and more peaceful. Comment so far. This last circumstance is particularly important. The majority of the European socialist leaders, of both the social chauvinist and Kautskyite trends, have become so much a prey to purely Philistine prejudices, fostered by decades of relatively, quote, peaceful capitalism and the bourgeois parliamentary system, that they are unable to understand what Soviet power and the dictatorship of the proletariat mean. The proletariat cannot perform its epic-making, liberating mission unless it removes these leaders from its path, unless it sweeps them out of its way. These people believed, or half-believed, the bourgeois lies about Soviet power in Russia and were unable to distinguish the nature of the new proletarian democracy, democracy for the working people, socialist democracy, as embodied in Soviet government from bourgeois democracy, which they slavishly worship and call, quote, pure democracy, or democracy in general. Comment, this is an important point. Do you have democracy in general for all classes under capitalism? No, yet these opportunists were saying that you could have that. Of course, bourgeois society is formed around and based on the class interests of the capitalists. And if capitalism were actually so accommodating that you could have proletarian class interests represented equally, why would you even need to get rid of it? And so you see that these people calling themselves Marxist were actually just promoting bourgeois ideology, and laying the groundwork for the perpetuation of capitalism. Continuing, these blind people, fettered by bourgeois prejudices, failed to understand the epoch-making change from bourgeois to proletarian democracy, from bourgeois to proletarian dictatorship, or overall rule of society. They confused certain specific features of Russian Soviet government, of the history of its development in Russia, with Soviet government as an international phenomenon. The Hungarian proletarian revolution is helping even the blind to see. The form of transition to the dictatorship of the proletariat in Hungary is altogether different from that in Russia. Voluntary resignation of the bourgeois government. Instantaneous restoration of working class unity. Socialist unity on a communist program. The nature of Soviet power is now all the clearer. The only form of rule which has the support of the working people and of the proletariat at their head that is now possible anywhere in the world is Soviet rule the dictatorship of the proletariat. This dictatorship presupposes the ruthlessly severe, 
swift, and resolute use of force to crush the resistance of the exploiters, the capitalists, landowners, and their underlings. Whoever does not understand this is not a revolutionary and must be removed from the post of leader or advisor of the proletariat. But the essence of proletarian dictatorship is not in force alone, or even mainly in force. Its chief feature is the organization and discipline of the advanced contingent of the working people, of their vanguard, of their sole leader, the proletariat, whose object is to build socialism, abolish the division of society into classes, make all members of society working people, and remove the basis for all exploitation of man by man. This object cannot be achieved at one stroke. It requires a fairly long period of transition from capitalism to socialism, because the reorganization of production is a difficult matter, because radical changes in all spheres of life need time, and because the enormous force of habit of running things in a petty bourgeois and bourgeois way can only be overcome by a long and stubborn struggle. That is why Marx spoke of an entire period of the dictatorship of the proletariat as the period of transition from capitalism to socialism. And here Lenin is citing Marx's critique of the Gotha or Gotha program, which we have here on the channel as an audiobook. Continuing, Throughout the whole of this transition period, resistance to the revolution will be offered, both by the capitalists and by their numerous warriors among the bourgeois intellectuals, who will resist consciously, and by the vast mass of the working people, including the peasants, who are shackled very much by petty bourgeois habits and traditions, and who all too often will resist unconsciously. Vacillations among these groups are inevitable. As a working man, the peasant gravitates towards socialism and prefers the dictatorship of the workers to the dictatorship of the bourgeoisie. But as a seller of grain, the peasant gravitates toward the bourgeoisie, toward freedom of trade, i.e., back to the habitual, old, quote, time-hallowed capitalism. What is needed to enable the proletariat to lead the peasants and the petty bourgeois groups in general is the dictatorship of the proletariat, the rule of one class, its strength of organization and discipline, its centralized power based on all the achievements of the culture, science, and technology of capitalism, its proletarian affinity to the mentality of every working person, its prestige with the disunited, less developed working people in the countryside or in petty industry who are less firm in politics. Here, phrase-mongering about democracy in general, about unity, or the unity of labor democracy, about the, quote, equality of all, quote, men of labor, and so on and so forth, the phrase-mongering for which the now petty bourgeois social chauvinists and Kautskyites have such a predilection is of no use whatever. Phrase-mongering only throws dust in the eyes, blinds the mind, and strengthens the old stupidity, conservatism, and routine of capitalism, the parliamentary system, and bourgeois democracy. The abolition of classes requires a long, difficult, and stubborn class struggle, which, after the overthrow of capitalist rule, after the destruction of the bourgeois state, after the establishment of the dictatorship of the proletariat, does not disappear, as the vulgar representatives of the old socialism and the old social democracy imagine, but merely changes its forms, and in many respects becomes fiercer. The proletariat, by means of a class struggle against the resistance of the bourgeoisie, against the conservatism, routine, irresolution, and vacillation of the petty bourgeoisie, must uphold its power, strengthen its organizing influence, neutralize those groups which fear to leave the bourgeoisie and which follow the proletariat too hesitantly, and consolidate the new discipline, the comradely discipline of the working people, their firm bond with the proletariat, their unity with the proletariat, that new discipline, that new basis of social ties, in place of the serf discipline of the Middle Ages, and the discipline of starvation, the discipline of, quote, free wage slavery under capitalism. In order to abolish classes, a period of the dictatorship of one class is needed, the dictatorship of precisely that oppressed class, which is capable not only of overthrowing the exploiters, not only of ruthlessly crushing their resistance, but also of breaking ideologically with the entire bourgeois democratic outlook, with all the Philistine phrase-mongering about liberty and equality in general. In reality, this phrase-mongering implies, as Marx demonstrated long ago, the, quote, liberty and equality of commodity owners, the, quote, liberty and equality of the capitalist and the worker. More, classes can be abolished only by the dictatorship of that oppressed class which has been schooled, united, trained, and steeled by decades of the strike and political struggle against capital. That class alone, which has assimilated all the urban, industrial, big capitalist culture and has the determination and ability to protect it and to preserve and further develop all its achievements and make them available to all the people, to all the working people, of that class alone, 
which will be able to bear all the hardships, trials, privations, and great sacrifices which history inevitably imposes upon those who break with the past and boldly hew a road for themselves to a new future. That class alone, whose finest members are full of hatred and contempt for everything petty bourgeois and philistine, for the qualities that flourish so profusely among the petty bourgeoisie, the minor employees, and the, quote, intellectuals. That class alone, which has, quote, been through the hardening school of labor, and is able to inspire respect for its efficiency in every working person and every honest person. Hungarian workers, comrades, you have set the world an even better example than Soviet Russia by your ability to unite all socialists at one stroke on the platform of genuine proletarian dictatorship. You are now faced with the most gratifying and most difficult task of holding your own in a rigorous war against the Entente. Be firm. Should vacillation manifest itself among the socialists who yesterday gave their support to you, to the dictatorship of the proletariat, or among the petty bourgeoisie, suppress it ruthlessly. In war, the coward's legitimate fate is the bullet. You are waging the only legitimate, just, and truly revolutionary war, a war of the oppressed against the oppressors, a war of the working people against the exploiters, a war for the victory of socialism. All honest members of the working class all over the world are on your side. Every month brings the world proletarian revolution nearer. Be firm, victory will be yours. Lenin, May 27, 1919. And that is the end of the audiobook. So, I was making notes as we were going. Actually, there's a lot that really deserves to be discussed in this, so I'm just going to go through it again. So the first point I'd like to underline is that the majority of the European socialist leaders, said Lenin, of both the social chauvinist and Kautskyite trends, have become so much a prey to purely Philistine prejudices, fostered by decades of relatively, quote, peaceful capitalism and the bourgeois parliamentary system, that they are unable to understand what Soviet power and the dictatorship of the proletariat mean. Okay, so what I'd like to point out here is what does peaceful capitalism mean? The Marxist approach to history is a scientific and materialist one. That means we don't just take abstract ideas and try to glue them on top of reality, making material conditions conform to those ideas. We take the material conditions that exist, analyze them carefully, and then look to advance them to the next step that they can take. In other words, as Marx said in the German ideology, this is the active overthrowing of the world that exists now, of current conditions. Yes, this is guided by an ideology about what the eventual end result will be, and it's acting in accordance with proletarian class interests, but the actual starting point from any given moment is the moment that exists at that point. So the enemy, capital, has different faces depending on what kind of moment it finds itself in. When it's in peacetime, that is, it is negotiating the redivision of the world between the big capitalists by just purely peaceful democratic means, it acts one way. And when it has to switch to wartime mode, when they need to accomplish through violence who is going to get what territory, it acts differently. And so it's more vulnerable when it has to go into war because it is arming proletarians, there's a crackdown on civil rights, it's generally in a state of distress, and that leaves it more vulnerable to, say, I don't know, a revolution. So the stage dressing of bourgeois democratic norms for governing society tend to go out the window at this time. Because first and foremost, they need to protect their profit-oriented system and their private ownership of industry. So what Lenin is saying is that the old socialist leaders of the type who were running the Second Socialist International, which completely sold out the European working class by endorsing World War I, exactly the thing they said they wouldn't do, had basically become soft because they had allowed, over decades of sort of peacetime capitalism, they had allowed themselves to believe the rhetoric that the bourgeoisie and petty bourgeoisie were circulating with regard to how democratic capitalism is and forever will be, etc., and then actually a war breaks out, and no, they're going to feed you into the meat grinder and then do fascism. And so as Lenin is saying, leaders, or leaders in quotes, who have allowed their Marxism to be so corrupted, poisoned and revised by bourgeois ideas, need to be removed from positions of leadership of the proletarian movement because they are no longer upholding proletarian ideology. They can't see what is, they can't see where they are supposed to lead people, and they will not lead people to socialism. So the next point is about the dictatorship of the proletariat. So Lenin points out the proletariat is not the only class that works. The peasantry, for example, also works. Also petty capitalists. It's basically a rural petty bourgeoisie. 
And so they vacillate, they go back and forth. It's like the old frosted mini wheats commercial. The worker in them likes the way that the workers run society, but the capitalist in them really strives for that free trade and to get as much profit as they can. So they're conflicted. They cannot be in the lead. Only the proletariat can because it's only the proletariat that has the qualities Lenin described in here of having the object of building socialism and abolishing the division of society into classes or ending class society, while preserving the actual cultural and technological progress that capitalism did make. Capitalism, again, is recognized by Marxism as being progressive over feudalism in that respect. However, it is still marked by class contradiction and struggle, and as long as it goes on, there's going to be strife, inequality, poverty, war. It is not the end of history. Again, class struggle is the engine of history, and it's going to keep pushing on. So there will even be, another point mentioned in here, a long period of transition between capitalism and full socialism or communism. So you have this long period of the dictatorship of the proletariat. Now, in November and December, we did a mini-series about the Sino-Soviet split, which occurred in the late 1950s and 1960s, where China separated from the USSR over policy changes and ideological changes that were presented in the Communist Party of the Soviet Union under the leadership of Nikita Khrushchev. Khrushchev was bringing in all kinds of reformist and petty bourgeois ideas that were starting to swallow up the proletarian ideology that the Communist Party should have been putting out even going so far as to declare the end of the dictatorship of the proletariat after just 40 years of existence. At best, this could be understood as rushing ahead to communism when absolutely conditions did not indicate that, quote, full communism had been remotely achieved. Capitalism was still the dominant force on the planet. What were they doing? Well, no, that's not a mistake any actual Marxist-Leninist could make. What they were doing was reintroducing petty capitalism and laying the groundwork for the restoration of big capitalism. And what Lenin says here about the dictatorship of the proletariat, the proletariat being essential, it's necessary that the proletariat is in the lead. So here's the quote again. What is needed to enable the proletariat to lead the peasants and the petty bourgeois groups in general is the dictatorship of the proletariat, the rule of one class, its strength of organization and discipline, its centralized power based on all the achievements of the culture, science, and technology of capitalism, its proletarian affinity to the mentality of every working person, its prestige with the disunited, less developed working people in the countryside or in petty industry who are less firm in politics. And then this is key. Here, phrase-mongering about, quote, democracy in general, so this is a sort of class collaborationist or class-free democracy, which you can't have under class society, it's going to be dominated by one class or another, about, quote, unity, or the, quote, unity of labor democracy, about the, quote, equality of all, quote, men of labor, and so on and so forth. The phrase-mongering for which the now petty bourgeois social chauvinists and Kautskyites have such a predilection is of no use whatsoever. This kind of phrase-mongering only throws dust in the eyes, blinds the mind, and strengthens the old stupidity, conservatism, and routine of capitalism, the parliamentary system, and bourgeois democracy. The abolition of classes requires a long, difficult, and stubborn class struggle, which, after the overthrow of capitalist rule, after the destruction of the bourgeois state, after the establishment of the dictatorship of the proletariat, does not disappear, but merely changes its forms. The class struggle just changes its forms. It continues under socialism and, in many respects, becomes fiercer. So, yes, we see here Lenin affirming that class struggle does continue under socialism, and this, to me, strikes at the heart of the Khrushchevite ideas of like, well, we had class struggle for 40 years, it's done now, we have full communism, hey, maybe the parties in the West can just embrace reformism. Like, wait a minute, slow down with this flood, this torrent of petty bourgeois reformist thinking. And in actual fact, less than three decades later, the USSR would be on full track to be restoring capitalism. And then, of course, everything fell apart in the early 90s. So I think you get the point. I would encourage you to read and reread this one. It has a lot of important stuff in a small space. And if anything, you know, Lenin was probably overly optimistic here about the scenario of Soviet Hungary. And, you know, saying that this is an even better example than Soviet Russia, and they set it up more easily, etc. Well, in fact, it didn't last. And it turns out maybe to actually have a revolution that sticks, you're going to be fighting counter-revolution for years, just as Russia did, just as preceded the establishment of the USSR. Maybe there is no other way. 
Maybe the capitalists really never will give up so easily. Maybe they always will resort to extreme violence to try to reprivatize things and bring things back under their control. So it looked like Soviet Hungary was going to be this new example that had an easier transition. No, in fact, the capitalists really just do get that violent basically every time. And probably any examples that appear to contradict this should be considered as the exceptions that prove the rule. All right, what do you think? Leave a question or comment below. We'll continue the discussion there as always. Otherwise, thanks for listening. And thanks to the current patrons and Buy Me A Coffee supporters whose names are on the screen. If you'd like to get your name on the screen, head to patreon.com slash socialism for all or buymeacoffee.com slash socialism for all. If you like this channel, thank me, but also thank a patron or buy me a coffee supporter because they have enabled me to spend so much time on this and make a long four year now commitment to this channel. As a proletarian, I do consider it my revolutionary duty to make contributions to this. But again, this kind of sustained support allows me to spend the time on it. I am certainly, as Lenin said in here, full of hatred and contempt for everything petty bourgeois and philistine. This effort gives me an excellent outlet for voicing that constructively and trying to do something about that in the world. And I just so appreciate the community that is gathering around this stuff and actually learning it and then taking it back into your local left, into wherever the class struggle is popping up in your area and fighting, because that is what this is all about. We have a world to win. Let's do it. For now, I'll see you in the next video.